if we proceed to build this without him, we will bear no better than the builders of Babel. He concluded by saying, and again I paraphrase, I beseech you therefore that from now henceforth, before we proceed to our deliberations, we meet in this chamber for prayer, seeking his wisdom and direction. They left the Constitutional Convention under the leadership of Pastor John Witherspoon, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence for prayer and fasting. They came back in a totally different spirit, in a spirit of harmony, on their knees every morning. Seven weeks later, they gave us the greatest document that has ever been written in history, the Constitution of the United States of America. I believe that the Constitution of the United States is a divinely inspired document because it was forged on the knees of the framers. And I'll tell you, you look at the Constitution, you know what the number one source for the Constitution was? The Bible. Number two source, Blackstone's Dictionary of Law, where every definition is based on the Bible. That's why it's lasted two centuries, over two centuries. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Why do we have three branches of government? Isaiah 33, 22, which says, for the Lord is our judge, that's a judicial branch. The Lord is our lawgiver, that's a legislative branch. The Lord is our king, that's the executive branch. That's why we have three branches of government. Comes right out of the word of God. Why are churches tax exempt? Didn't come from the IRS. It comes from Ezra 7.24, which says, I certify to you, touching any of the priests, Levites, singers, porters, ministers of the house, that it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. It comes right out of the word of God. Why do we have the death penalty? It wasn't a whim of somebody. Come straight out of Genesis 9, 6. The first statement concerning government in the Bible. And basically God says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man's shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. See what this does. God is saying life is so precious. So very precious. Created in the image of God that if you take a life, you must pay with your own. What the death penalty does is elevate the value of life. And you see the liberals trying to come out with their little violins to talk against the death penalty. <laughs> the places where you don't have death penalty, you have a lot higher crime. It works. Now, let's look at what the Word of God has to say uh, in the New Testament about God and in the Old Testament. We'll get there too. Look at what it says about elected government officials. It says in Romans 13, 4, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Well, unfortunately, some of the politicians have not read that. <laughs> but if thou do what that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. That is the biblical function, according to the word of God, of a political official. Now, not many of them are following this, but it says he, he yields a sword to execute wrath upon those that do evil. So when you vote, you are transferring your authority to that elected official to represent you. Right. He becomes someone that is supposed to be representing your values. Now, look at 1 Timothy 1, 8 and 9. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. 
And then look at Second Chronicles 19, 5 and 6. It says, and he set judges in the land throughout all, and I put this in white because it's very relevant to today, all the princes, cities of Judah, city by city. Did you know that every city in Israel had a wall? And a very high wall? Okay? These walls were not Trump's idea. Even in the time of Israel. When they came to Jericho, what did they find? A wall. A wall. And the wall had to come down before they could come in. Jerusalem had a big wall all around and all the cities. The fence cities of Judah, city by city. So maybe you need to quote this to these people that don't want the wall. <laughs> you don't have a country without borders. And said to the judges, look what he's, the judges you could say, the political officials, okay? Take heed what you do, for you judge not for man, but for the Lord who is with you in the judgment. Too many politicians need to understand this. Because not too many of them do. They have been placed in a position of authority to exercise the judgment from God. To be a minister of God's righteousness. And now I want to go to Matthew 28, which is what is called the Great Commission. But I can guarantee you that many of you have probably missed this about the Great Commission. Jesus began by saying, all authority in heaven and in earth is given unto me. Look at the next three words. Go ye therefore. What does that mean? That means that he is transferring his authority to us. He is transferring his authority onto us to go in his name. First he says, all authority in heaven and in earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore. How do you go ye therefore? Or in his authority. Now, Galatians 6, 7 is what is called the law of the heart. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And you know something? What you sow is what you're going to reap. If you plant apples, you ain't going to get bananas. <laughs> so, you make sure that you're sowing in good ground. Because you know something? Your vote is a seed. It's going to produce a crop. The crop is going to depend upon where you plant that seed. Am I, am I getting across? So, look at what Mark chapter 4, Mark part chapter 4 is called the parable of the soil. And it talks about four different kinds of soil. You got some, some seed that fell by the wayside. You had some field seed that fell among rocks. You had some seed that fell among the thorns, but you had some seed that fell on good ground. And it produced 30-fold, and 60-fold, and 100-fold. Your vote is a seed. Be careful where you plant it. Now, you look at Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. And I'm not going to read it all, but I want you to look at what I what I, I highlighted there. Hands that shed innocent blood. And I, as a matter of fact, I want you to look in the other seven, the, the other six. Most of them have to deal with the tongue. We do a lot of damage with our tongue. But I want to focus on the shedding of innocent blood. What could be more innocent than the blood of an unborn baby. Look what is happening in America today. Now it goes beyond abortion. We have a, a couple of states now that have said, well, even after the baby is born, the parents have the right to say, well, I don't want it, you can kill that baby. 
That's murder. That is infanticide. As a matter of fact, on the current law, those people could be prosecuted as murderers. God help us. God says, I hate the shedding of innocent lives. Let me tell you something. If you vote for a candidate who promotes abortion, you become complicit in the murder of over 60 million babies. I know that sounds very hard, but that's exactly the way I see it. You become complicit in the murder of babies, innocent babies. No, it's not a woman's choice. It is a human life. You want to know when life com com commences, when it starts? All you have to do is read Jeremiah 1.5. And God says, before you were conceived in your mother's womb, I knew you. I think that settles when life began. It is murder. Abortion is murder. Abortion is mur murder, and this is an issue that we cannot compromise in. Every abortion is the mur murder of an innocent child of God. Now, Charles Finney was the principal preacher during the Second Great Awakening. I want to sh share with you just a couple of statements that he made in a much longer discourse. He said, if Satan rules the halls of legislation, well, it looks like we're reading this week's newspaper, doesn't it? <laughs> he says, the pulpit is responsible for it. Now, lest you say, well, I'm not a preacher, he's not talking to me. We all have a pulpit. It may be the place where you work. It may be the place where you go to school. It may be your extended family. It may be your Sunday school teacher. Or the place where you teach in school. We all have a pulpit. He said if Satan rules the halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. Look at the next one. If our politics has become so corrupt, that the very foundation of our government is ready to fall away. Are we there today? Yeah. Sure looks that way, doesn't it? But he notice that he doesn't blame the politicians. He blames the pulpit. He blames the pastors, the priests, the rabbis. Why? Why is he blaming the pastors, the priests, and the rabbis? Because they're tickling men's and women's ears. Let me tell you, the next statement tells you why he blames them. Look at the next statement. And look at it carefully. He said, let us not ignore this fact, my dear brethren, but let us lay it to heart and be thoroughly awake to our responsibility in respect to the morals of this nation. You know, the biggest lie that we've been fed, and I've heard so many people of faith say it, politics cannot legislate morality. That is a lie. Politics legislates morality all the time. 